of water management. Um, what I want to say in the beginning is that I'm going to discuss the concepts in uh, evapotranspiration based irrigation scheduling, the tools and techniques that we use in California. Irrigation scheduling is really a very site specific and orchard system specific issue. So obviously you would want to make adjustments on your scheduling and uh, the way you uh, apply irrigation to your orchards based on uh, different soil, climate, orchard system situations here in Georgia. The principles of evapotranspiration based irrigation scheduling will be the same though. So let's talk about the principles and uh, another thing that I want to, I uh, spent some time to convert the, the formulas uh, into metric units. Uh, so let's see if I did a good job or not there. So you will see if there is some error in calculation. We'll do some calculations here uh, in a moment. So basically, how to calculate water use and irrigation requirements for orchard crops. The almond trees water needs. Someone asked a question uh, yesterday, how much um, water the almond trees in California need in a typical season. Uh, we put the figure at 52 acre inches. Uh, that is coming from the University of California's research and recommendations. Uh, practically, that's um, not the case with uh, many of the orchards because there are huge uh, you know, variability is the factors that actually determine how much water. So 52 has been the long-term learning uh, that a typical orchard growing in sandy loam soil with conventional planting design with 80% canopy light interception would actually need 52 acre inches for best production. Um, that translates to 13 megaliters. Uh, per year. Many orchards in California get away with applying less water these days <coughs> because one, water is in short supply in California. So the growers and the managers, they try every tool available to save water, to increase their water use efficiency, to, to see where they can cut back water. Maybe they identify certain growth phases where they can reduce water. So uh, they save water as well as they do not have any reduction in yield. So that is the reason when I say uh, get away with applying less water. Uh, I have seen people applying 42 inches or 48 inches of water depending on the soil type that they have, depending on the water availability district that they have. Obviously, uh, if you are decreasing, like I mentioned, the almond production function study yesterday, if you are decreasing proportionately as a percentage of uh, this 100% uh, water need, uh, as you decrease in proportion, um, the almond production function study tells us that up to 80% of the full irrigation, uh, you stay within the range of uh, full production, uh, not having significant effect, but if you reduce further, if you have only 75% water available and you apply less or 50%, then you are going to reduce the yield in proportion. So that translates to 10 to 12 max, uh, so basically right around 12, 13, uh, or 10 to 13 is the broader range that people target. Now those, those orchards apply efficient irrigation systems. They apply the concept of regulated deficit irrigation, which means identifying certain growth stages where they can cut back on water. And then proper irrigation scheduling. So, would they, the 15 megaliters is per hectare or per acre? I think I, when I did megaliters, I think it's per hectare. Yeah. We can do a quick calculation though. But. This is per hectare, right? Per hectare. Yeah. 12,000 tons per hectare. Yeah, so, so because when I did the calculations uh, from inches, acre inches, uh, to megaliters, basically I uh, To understand it, it is about uh, 12,000 tons per hectare. 
So, yeah, yeah, so I'm not sure which kind of terminology because in Australia they use megaliters. They think it's too much. It is too much. This is too much? No, no, not too much. <laughs> so basically, I, I, I just translate. <laughs> one megaliter is a uh, <laughs> million liters. One megaliter is a 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 million liters. One uh, because in California, when I uh, discuss this in the classroom or we discuss with the farmers, we really have uh, figured out in acre inches and number of gallons per tree per day. That's the language that we talk in California, like treatment in number of gallons per tree per day based on the evapotranspiration needs. And then we can convert it to the runtime, how long you are running your run set based on your output. Uh, and the overall VT evapotranspiration. So this is how it goes. The evapotranspiration is based on the formula of uh, you know the reference evapotranspiration multiplied by the crop coefficient. I don't want to go into the technical details of it, but, but uh, just just to lay down the foundation, um, the reference evapotranspiration is basically a sum total of evaporation and transpiration from an empty grass-based ecosystem without any trees or orchards on it. That's the standard that we use. Uh, that is called ET0, the reference evapotranspiration. And that data is available from uh, several different uh, meteorological websites or weather stations. Now, now you're growing almond trees on that, uh, on your orchard, so you have to bring in a factor that actually translates that into the water requirement of the almond trees. So we use a crop coefficient for your particular crop in case of, in this case, we will use the, uh, the crop coefficient for almonds. The crop coefficient is called Kc, and we have worked out the crop coefficient for almonds. So for coming up with evapotranspiration for your crop, which is ETC, uh, and we will stay in inches up to here because when I researched uh, the, the website that gives you uh, the evapotranspiration data in Georgia, I stumbled upon a website called Medio Blue. And Medio Blue also gives you the FAO reference evapotranspiration in inches for Georgia. So I have some, uh, some graphs uh, for the last week. Uh, in Georgia for evapotranspiration. Um, so I prefer to stay in inches because the ETO is available in inches. So this is basically one day for June 30 because that was a predicted. So I was in California last week when I picked this number for June 30 for one of the locations in Kathiri. So that one day, the, the FAO uh, ETO, ET, zero data was saying that 0.32 inches was the requirement. That is based on the acre. One acre. Uh, we can we can actually go, go back to the let's, yeah we can go back to that. So 0.32 inches um, one inch will be 25.4 mm and like about 8 mm right yeah, 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 8 mm, 8 or 9. So then um, the crop coefficient that I used for almonds is based on uh, the research done in California. So this time of the year, we have a crop coefficient of 1.15, which means multiplying these two numbers, we get uh, a figure of 0.37 inches. So this is still based on per acre, OK? So 0.37 acre inches is the daily requirement for that day. That is what we come at, OK? Now, to convert this first to gallons per acre, I multiply this for the number of gallons each acre inch has. 
And then from gallons per day per acre, I went to liters per day per acre. And then I converted acre to hectare, and then I came up with liters per day per hectare, and then converted to megaliters by dividing it by one million. Okay. So, so one acre inch has 27,154 gallons. Okay. So you multiply 0.37 by 27,154, you get 999, uh, you know, uh, 9,993 gallons per day per acre. So on June 30, it, it's telling me that one acre of my fully grown trees is going to need about 10,000 gallons of water, one acre. Okay. Now I'm not bringing in the number of trees per acre. Okay. So basically, it's based on the overall. 80% can be covered. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, 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 it has different coefficients. For the number of trees? Yeah. yeah. We, will, we will go into that. Yeah, we will go into that. So the number of trees will come into the picture. Uh, the area, so it's important to know how much area you will cover. Am I right? Number of trees, how much area you will cover? Yeah, 80% or, or is how much basically... How light interception we're going to have? Right. So when we're discussing this example, uh, we are considering a fully grown, fully mature trees with uh, full canopy growth that they achieve, which is ideally at 80%. I'm uh, uh, sorry, I, uh, I don't want to stop it for a long time, but uh, this KC, I think, uh, um, which I'm using is from 0 0.75 to 0 0.9 maximum. Is it too low? Because 1.15, I think. Um, um, yes, yeah, so high. again, um, now, just to understand the concepts, that's the reason I just wanted to be careful of not like coming up with any recommendations based on this. But this is to teach the concept, right? Okay. So you can plug in your um, KC, whatever KC you have based on your, because KC will also be a factor of a lot of local climatic factors. How do we calculate crop coefficient? Crop coefficient, uh, this comes out from the research, uh, basically uh, the eddy covariance method is the one that they used recently. Um, and back then, like from the Durden, Boss and Kruert, uh FAO paper, that method is, I think it's, it's a different method, uh, not not the eddy covariance method. We already have this number, so we don't need to calculate KC. We so just take this number and multiply on ET, ETO. Yeah. So you, you already, based, based on the research for your uh, locality, you will already have this number set for the months or for the weeks of the year. So you will get that chart uh, as a permanent coefficient, as a constant. So do we have it in Georgia? For Georgia, I tried looking it up. Uh, I need to do some more research, uh, talking to some irrigation specialists or researchers here. Um, but I figured out that, uh, you know, the, from the FAO paper, that was, there was, uh, I, I think there was the research done in Europe. So I just plugged in these numbers from, um, you know, the FAO. I, I have the, that uh, table that has all the, coefficient from 1975 whenever the research was updated. 1.15 is the latest one in 2015 that was developed in California. This is the highest that we have. The FAO paper has right around maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, for almonds in June. Uh, but we realized in California that uh, it is actually higher. Um, and then there's some complication. We recently, um, in a recent research, uh, it was also realized, and there's a published paper in Peach, that when the trees go through stress period, the crop coefficient changes, so they adjust the crop. <coughs> so there are some compounding factors as well. Yes, please. Excuse me. Uh, these figures, um, are they without the wash-up calculation? With the wash up, I mean the efficiency of the irrigation when you drainage and oh, the irrigation efficiency, yes. right? So, the, so we have not plugged in anything yet. Okay. So it is just basic. More or less, more or less, we can calculate 20 percent less. 
depending on the system, yeah. So we will bring in the system efficiency, we will bring in the soil type, the water holding capacity, all of that. So and the morphology soil and the soil. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so this is pure, based on pure, uh, you know, acre inches uh, reference evapotranspiration. This is pure calculation. So now we have to factor in all the efficiency factors, and of course the. Uh, when you're coming to individual tree water demands, you will plug in the number of trees per hectare. So this is about 10,000 gallons per day per acre on June 30. Converted to like 38,000 liters per day per acre. Converted to uh, almost uh, close to 95,000, 94,000 liters per day per hectare, which is equivalent to 0.1 megaliters because if you round it off to 100,000 and divided by 1 million is basically 0.1 megaliters per day uh, per hectare. So that's how I will simply calculate what my trees, uh, what the evapotranspiration, 100% evapotranspiration uh, needs are, right? Now if you apply uh, this much, 100,000 liters every day, to that hectare of, obviously, your irrigation system is going to have some losses. So if you have 20% losses, uh, only 80% of that water is getting to the trees, actually. So basically, you ended up applying 80,000. So you're already applying less. So you have to adjust that number for your irrigation system efficiency. Uh, converting that to weekly ET for this week total, I totaled it. Uh, for seven days and it came out to be 2.3 ETO multiplied by the same KC because it remains the same. Uh, we came up with 2.65 evapotranspiration um, you know, for the crop in inches. Converted to 72,000 gallons per day per acre. Converted to uh, 271,000 uh, liters which came up to close to 700,000 liters per hectare per day. Uh, which is 0.7 megaliters. Okay. So this is the basic calculation. Let's move on. Um, we'll we'll uh, jump back into the calculation. Just to explain, go back to the evapotranspiration. This is the sum total of transpiration, which is a physical process, um, uh, and then um, no, transpiration, which is a physiological process, and the trans evaporation, which is a physical process. Okay. So these two, uh, you know, from from basic. Uh, uh, you know, grass-based ecosystem and uh, then the transmission from the tree. So it's some total of these two. Now, ET is a function of uh, so many different uh, things that have determined the total water demand, the temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind speed, and whether or not you have a cover crop in between those. Um, we generally divide the factors affecting the ET into two. One would be the crop factors, another would be the management factors. The crop factors are associated with your crop and orchard system. The management factors would be associated with your management that you can do up and down with, with your management. The crop factors like the crop that you have, the cultivars that you have, are phenological stage, the stage of development, uh, either in the life of the tree as a factor of age or uh, the phenological stage during the season, if it's bloom time, if it's dormant season, if it's um, you know during the season or post harvest, uh, the height of the canopy, the planting design, rooting depth and profile characteristics, all of that are crop factors. Ground cover is comes under both because uh, ground cover is also part of your cropping system, but it also it's also a management factor because you can plant or not plant ground cover as a management strategy. Uh, the management factors that you can actually control would be disease, insects, fertility program, presence of salinity, your irrigation system design, your planting design is again a management factor because you managed um, the planting design. Soil water content, wind breaks, mulches. Now this is the this is the usual chart that the evapotranspiration requirement goes throughout the year, okay, throughout the season. Uh, so this is the days of the year, starting with the early in January, and it goes up higher. Uh, that is the ETO, is the blue, uh, and then uh, it peaks in basically June, July, and August, and then September, October, November, and December. So this is it's basically a bell-shaped curve, and it 
uh, it goes with this deciduous nature of your own crop. Um, that they have a leaf out and a leaf fall. And ET changes with age, of course. The younger trees will have uh, lesser ET values on a per acre basis because when we talk about ET, we talk about on a per acre or per hectare basis. So the younger trees will have smaller canopies, so they will have smaller. Uh, and then that's another factor to bring into the picture if you are targeting younger trees. So there are a lot of things to bring in and modify your calculations, but for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of learning the concept, we go with one standard assumption and then work out our way to different situations. Um, Almond tree canopy size increases from year one to fully mature size uh, by year seven or eight. Uh, and then after that, typically they don't change much over the rest of the life of the tree. Um, yeah, and ET increases considerably during the first six, seven years because, um, because the trees are growing vegetables. Uh, again, this is, um, you know, this is a comparison of uh, just uh, you know, the climate or you know, the wind speed and humidity. Uh, in a dry, strong wind condition, you have the higher evapotranspiration in comparison with the humid light wind. So one factor can actually change the scenario. So, so you have to keep those factors in mind, uh, particularly to your site. Uh, and because you are getting the ET, uh, reference ET information based on your nearest uh, site or nearest weather station, so you don't have to worry about uh, this unless you have a really unique situation. Let's actually now talk about irrigation scheduling. Um, so what are the things that you need to know when you're talking about irrigation scheduling? First, you need to know your system output. Now there are two things. One is the demand side and another is the supply side. Let's talk about the supply side, what kind of capacity, capability you have to apply water. Your system out output, how many liters every hour you can put out to the trees. Knowing your soil type is like really important, how much water your soil can hold. Uh, I have some numbers for the water holding capacity of different textures of soil, ranging from very light to very heavy soils. So based on your soil type, your irrigation scheduling frequency will definitely uh, be a factor. Uh, then know your system's efficiency. So we talk about efficiency. So flood versus drip irrigation. In California situation, typically in a flood or furrow irrigation scenario, we assume that you know you have about 30-35% 30, 30, losses. So typically 65 to 75 percent efficiency is the number that we use for flood or furrow irrigation. For drip irrigation or micro sprinkler irrigation in California, we use about 90 percent to 95 percent irrigation efficiency. Um, it's impossible to achieve 100 percent irrigation efficiency because there are going to be uh, losses in the system. So. This is the, this is the uh, supply side that you're trying to supply. Now the demand side, you need to calculate how much water your trees are really needing, which we just talked about and we will go into the detail of that. Okay? So once you know how much water your trees are needing based on the evapotranspiration, and you know all these things, you can easily match the trees. Um, the biggest part now is to know trees daily water needs because you already have this figured out. You have your system output, which is not likely going to change dramatically over the season. Uh, soil type is already there, and you know your system's efficiency. That's all you figured out as a manager. Uh, Trees water needs is what's going to change daily, and that's what you need to know. So we use the evapotranspiration calculations for that, which I just showed you uh, a snapshot of. Now let's step back and look at why why this is so important uh, in case of almonds. Um, this is this side is the drought stress, this side is the excess moisture. And either of these conditions are harming uh, or detrimental to the crop. 
under drug stress, we can have kernel shiver. Especially, we have seen in California that in the month of May, when the endosperm in almonds is basically solidifying, you have the watery milky uh, endosperm and it starts solidifying. If your trees are under water stress at that time, um, you're really going to have the shivels on the, on the skin of the kernel. Uh, nut size reduction. Early on in the season, you know, I'm going to talk in California terms based on the late February bloom. Uh, if you have water stress in March or April, the tree, uh, the, the nut size is going to be reduced. Severe water stress, you, your trees can have wilting. Uh, and eventually defoliation. Uh, and again, water stress can inhibit the shoot growth. Uh, and we already talked about that. Yes. Um, on the, the, the opposite side, we have excess moisture. And like I mentioned, the, the almond trees are really very sensitive to continuously uh, having an environment with they have excess moisture. Um, that can cause leaching of nitrogen, um, for sure. And then waterlogging situation can cause um, hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen. And in some cases, if there is prolonged flooding, it can cause anoxia, which is complete lack of oxygen. And the roots need oxygen. Roots need breathe. The roots need oxygen for several different reasons. And one of them is that the roots are basically, uh, they, they don't make the foods, because the leaves make the food and send the food down to the roots. So the roots basically carry out respiration. Uh, the process of respiration uses the stored carbohydrates in the presence of oxygen to actually generate some energy. So the roots really need some breathing space. So we need some uh, free pore space in your soil. Um, water logging can increase the fungal diseases and they can uh, kill your trees. Of course, the water wastage if you have excess moisture all the time and energy wastage. Now coming to the important question of determining water needs. Um, let's go back to the age-old methods. Uh, before we had all these uh, tools and techniques, um, we really were familiar with our soils, uh, with our orchard, and we would just go out there and do just a visual method. In California, I know a lot of farmers who are farming for ages. They know their soil and they can just pick uh, the soil with an auger and then make a ball or a ribbon and they can tell you if the irrigation is needed or not. Um, and then you have some soil moisture probes uh, that can help you uh, monitor your soil moisture um, to see when you can start irrigation or not. Then you have weather-based methods, just like we are discussing the evapotranspiration method. And the newer ones are plant-based methods. Now, a lot of people feel that soil moisture is one thing, it's a good tool, uh, getting the soil moisture um, and knowing how much water there is. But eventually it is a secondary method because you want to know the actual water status of your tree. There could be some situation where you have higher amount of salts, for example, in your root zone. And with the high salinity conditions, there could be a situation where there is water available, a lot of moisture available in the soil, but the trees are not capable of taking that water up. So that creates a situation where your soil moisture sensor will not tell you the whole story. So a really advanced methods are plant-based methods like pressure chamber, and then I'll also show you some newer technology like dendrometers, dendrometers and the sap flow sensors. There is another uh, dimension to it. Now, when you really, when you are calculating uh, your irrigation scheduling, there are two aspects. One is how much water your trees are going to need. And another is when do you want to turn your irrigation on? Like when to start irrigation? So there are two questions. And both of these questions are answered using different tools. The evapotranspiration based, weather based methods will tell you how much water your trees are going to need in a particular day. But 
they don't necessarily tell you when those trees are like thirsty enough so that you turn your water, right? So to know the, the dendrometers and the pressure chamber, the tools like those, they tell you when it is the tipping point that you have to actually start your machine. So those are two aspects. Visual touch method, uh, trying to make a ribbon or a ball. Uh, based on your soil type, you can figure this out and be very good at. Uh, but in California, you know, because we really uh, don't have enough water, uh, so we are really pressed for using the, the advanced tools so that we, we keep the guesswork out of the picture. Uh, but this is a general guide uh, based on sandy all the way to clay soils. Uh, you pull out uh, from the root zone depth, you pull out some um, soil, and then you try making some ribbons. Okay, this is basically the general guide guideline right based on uh, your soil texture. Know your water application uh, rate for your system. For flood irrigation, you can calculate based on your pump output at the source. Uh, for drip or micro irrigation system, your output is basically listed on your specifications when you are installing the system. Uh, your irrigation company will basically give you the design documents that have the emitter output. Um, and I can convert the emitter output from gallons to liters. Uh, you know, typically we use like the micro sprinklers that have six or seven gallons per hour to ten gallons per hour. Um, the typical drip drip meters are 0 0.5, 0 0.54 gallons per hour. Um, so I probably already have uh, converted it to one fan jet, applies about 38 liters per hour, depending on the design. There are so many different products available. This is just one example. And then 0.54 is around 2 liters per hour. That is the typical scenario in California. Okay. So now, you know how many now this this now let's bring the number of trees into picture and i will be talking about a scenario where you have a drip irrigation or micro sprinkler irrigation so we can address the flood irrigation later i have one or two slides the drip irrigation or micro sprinkler you know how many emitters per tree you have in your system let's see each tree has eight emitters assigned to it okay now you know the output of one emitter multiplied by eight, so if it is two liters multiplied by eight, 16 liters. Now you know that your system can apply 16 liters in one hour to one tree, right? So you can set aside that number. Um, now you can calculate how many trees you have per hectare, which we already did yesterday. Now you know, like multiply or divide that, you know, whichever way you approach it, um, you know, when you're applying uh, on a per, uh, per tree basis, you can calculate the total number of trees in per hectare, per hectare, and then you already know that you have to apply 7,000 liters for one hectare. So if you have 700 trees per hectare, you can divide it by 700, if you have 400, uh, trees in that hectare, you can divide by the number of trees. So you can come up with one tree, single tree, like uh, based, based on a single tree. Uh, how many liters per day per tree you are needing. Once you get to that, now you already know that your each tree, you can supply 16 liters per hour, right? Still, we have not figured out the efficiency factor, but we will go to that. Uh, so you basically, you can just match the plan from there. Uh, going to flood and flood irrigation, we will simply calculate how much water the trees need daily on a per acre basis because you don't have the capability of the per tree um, application in a flood irrigation scenario. You flood the whole acre. So you will basically calculate for the whole acre or for, for the whole hectare for the week and you see that this is the number of mm or inches that you need to apply and you open the flood irrigation system and then let that water settle down. 
are perfected in the losses. Um, so we already did these calculations, uh, calculated the number of trees per acre. So in my example, uh, in a typical traditional six meter by four meter, we have 417 trees per acre. In my example, so I'm sticking with this number. Okay. Now this is the website that I, this is the California based website, so ignore this. Um, and I went to the Meteor, Meteor Blue website, which I will, I have the screenshots. So you get the ETO, and uh, this is the previous years, and so you have the average ETO data for, for your, and you can create a table. So then you multiply that ETO with KC and come up with ETC, okay. And that's all you need uh, to input your mitigation efficiency, uh, and then you will go forward. Um, you, you factor in your irrigation efficiency, you determine your crop ED already, and then all you need to do is calculate the number of hours that you run your irrigation for. Um, now, let's talk about um, one thing that you need to know is water holding capacity of your soil. That is really important in determining the frequency of irrigation. Okay? For example, how much water your soil can hold for every feet of your soil profile. If it's really sandy soil, it can hold only like half an inch of water, which is what, 12, 13, uh, 12, 13 uh, mm for every feet. Uh, and you are irrigating for the four foot soil profile. Uh, so basically, your soil profile, the whole root zone, cannot hold more than 50 mm of water at any given time, right? So then you need to really consider <coughs> increasing your frequency because if your tree's water demands are like 100 mm, you cannot apply that 100 mm at one time because your soil can only hold 50 mm. So then you have to split into two irrigations. So you don't want to exceed your soil's water holding capacity. So to decide the frequency of application, so you need to think about your soil type. So this is uh, almond crop coefficients uh, based on the almond production manual. So this is what we were using before, before the 2015 research. And look at this, um, you know, I think this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is what we've been using in California. So, uh, this is still different from uh, from the 1975 paper. Based on that, this is uh, 1.15 from June, July, and August. Uh, so we used uh, 1.15. This is again that uh, same uh, table. So irrigation system efficiency uh, for general guideline: the basin of crop irrigation, uh, 65 to 75 typically, or 80 percent sometimes. For irrigation, 65 to 75. Uh, solid set sprinkler 75 to 85 and micro sprinkler and drip irrigation around 90 to 95. So irrigation efficiency is important. Once you do this calculation, ETC, then divide that by irrigation efficiency. Divide that by 0.9 if you have 90% efficiency. Okay. So in my hypothetical, in my scenario where I came up with the ETC, the evapotranspiration for your crop, for June 30, uh, I came up with 0.35 uh, inches per day, and I have to factor in 90% efficiency. So I have to divide that point by 0 0.9. That uh, comes up to 0.38 inches per day. Now, if you apply 0.38, uh, your trees will get 0.35 based on 90% efficiency. This is a chart showing the soil's water holding capacity, very coarse soils. Now I converted these to mm per feet. This is the range for very coarse sandy soils, 15 to 25 mm per feet. The average is about 19 mm per foot. And goes all the way up to, in clay soils, up to 43 to 61 mm per feet, which is around an average of 50 mm. Uh, so don't apply more water than this capacity in a single irrigation. <coughs> this is just to, to draw a pictorial uh, representation of 
the the field capacity and the concept of water holding capacity. If you think of your soil like a sponge okay, that absorbs and keeps water. Uh, this is like saturation, then all the water, uh, once it flows down with gravity, uh, you have the stored moisture of the fully filled profile. That is what we call field capacity. And then when all that water is basically uh, gone, gone or withdrawn, uh, then you approach the wilting point, which is the permanent wilting point would be where your trees will be permanently damaged. So let's go to gallon per hour. Uh, so if you know your system's output, one acre inch is 27,000 gallons, and then you calculate the runtime. Uh, another factors to, other factors to keep in mind, the ground cover, if you have the ground co cover, that's going to change your crop coefficient a little bit. Um, and then irrigation distribution uniformity, that's a really important factor. Uh, irrigation timing um, and um, system efficiency. Okay, those are all things. Uh, so this is, uh, again, I'm showing you these concepts of field capacity and between the field capacity and melting point, that is the available water. That is the total soil available water that we call it. Uh, not 100% of this available water is allowed to be used up, okay? Only 50% of this water we allow the plants to, to uh, use before we apply another irrigation. So we call that MAD, maximum allowable depletion. Okay. Uh, so this is the water budget method, like the bucket method. So in old days, when you were just replenishing with flood or furrow irrigation, you take off your profile like a bucket, and each day you are using some from that bucket, uh, like in inches, you know, the ET, every day in this case 0 0.55, 0 0.6, 0 0.75, uh, and then you total for this whole week. So in this week, you emptied that bucket up to this point. And so this is the total soil available water in that bucket. We did not want to go beyond 50% of that. That is the only, that is the allowable depletion based on the total, okay? So as we deplete the bucket up to this point, then we have to apply irrigation, okay? So in this case, uh, we are doing the flood irrigation, and this is the period of days, so this is basically not for the week. And this is the, like a three day period. So for total 21 days, in this case, we have the plant water needs of 4.2 inches. Now you flood irrigate for the 21 days and apply this, this much water, plus any losses, plus any system losses to factor in the irrigation efficiency. Now this is too much water applying at one time, okay, right? So, um, but based on the water holding capacity of your soil, if your soil are holding one inch per feet and you're applying for four feet of, um, four feet of um, soil profile for your root zone, that brings it to four inches, right? So that's pretty close. Okay. So, so, this is uh, where I stop in the calculation because I know it can be overwhelming. So I brought this um, board closer so that we can actually plug in some numbers and calculate. Uh, so we will do some calculations and discussions uh, together. Uh, once I finish, go through the next 10, 15 slides. Okay. Now the technology that we have in California, we have the soil-based monitoring, which you're already familiar with. We have the plant-based monitoring, including the pressure chamber uh, and other uh, that I will talk about. And then the newer one is uh, the aerial satellite imagery or drone imagery by the aircraft. That is really catching up. Soil moisture monitoring, you have different kinds of soil moisture sensors, like tensiometer. Tensiometers are uh, basically the probes that measure the, uh, the soil's water pressure. The, the water pressure is a, basically a measure of how tightly the water is held within the soil. So the higher 
uh, the value that means the more uh, scarce the water is for the plants to get. Okay. Um, so they can indicate lack of water. They, they usually measure in centibars or kilopascals. They are basically the same uh, unit. And 10 to 25 centibars is basically the soil at uh, field capacity. Zero centibars would mean that if the soil is fully saturated and there's free water in it. Um, there are other soil moisture probes based on measuring the relative water content. They are also uh, popular, uh, such as the neutron probes or dielectric uh, sensors, uh, like capacitance probe or TDR probe. So all of their um, fundamental that they're based on is basically they measure the relative water content. So once you have these probes installed and calibrated for your particular soil type, then you can basically just do the readings uh, from the sensors and then uh, make sense of those numbers. Plant-based monitoring, dendrometers are really catching up. A dendrometer is basically a, a very precise uh, instrument device uh, that can measure the, the day to night variation in the, the stem uh, diameter or the stem radius. Um, because the, the plants, they expand and shrink, expand and shrink. So during the daytime, um, when they, they're actively utilizing water, they, they shrink and at night they expand. So the daily shrinkage, the maximum daily shrinkage, uh, that uh, the, the, the range of sensitivity that these instruments can measure. Uh, so they are permanently installed on the tree trunk with a needle uh, penetrating. Uh, into the tree bark, uh, and and then with with that uh, little movement in fraction of an mm, uh, they will basically give you the data on maximum daily shrinkage. And this has a strong correlation with the stem water potential of the tree. So I pulled this data from the UC research reported by PyTech on their website, uh, done by my former colleagues uh, David Dahl and others uh, in Northern California. So they are showing uh, three different irrigation strategies. Uh, basically, this is the green line is uh, when they apply 100% uh, water, they match the evapotranspiration needs. And then they apply a little bit uh, more, it's 116%, uh, uh, that was the blue. And then when they apply less water, only 75% of the total needs. Uh, so these are the diagonal shrinkage and expansion, the maximum daily shrinkage. Uh, and these are the three strategies that actually led to the seasonal trunk growth. Uh, the less water you applied, you had uh, compromised the trunk growth. And then as you applied more water, you had higher uh, vegetative growth uh, in the season. Uh, and then stress to yield duration, if you have less than five days of the seasonal stress, uh, your yield are significantly higher. If you have more than five, so they develop very good uh, you know, correlations. And this is the one showing uh, how the maximum daily shrinkage is correlated with stem water potential. Sap flow sensors, again, uh, permanently installed on one of the limbs of the tree, or can be installed on the main trunk. And they also protrude into the bark, and they measure the sap. Uh, the water inside the plant moves through the xylem. But because the water, that water has uh, nutrients and hormones and other metabolites mixed in it, so we don't uh, call it plain water, we call it sap. So the sap flows up and down, and this sap flow sensor actually measures the sap activity. And that would actually tell you if the tree is stressed or not, or how, how high the evapotranspiration is within the tree um, based on the water movement. Plant-based monitoring, uh, pressure chamber. So you might be familiar with this instrument already. Cool. So we do a lot of uh, pressure chamber measurement. This is a little bit uh, tedious to use, but this is really accurate. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we call it pressure bomb. And I have my pressure bomb joke that I say that because this helps us save water, so I'm pretty confident that we finally have a bomb that can save the world. So, so I, sometimes I like to call pressure bomb, but only when I'm talking to people, when I'm emailing 
I prefer to call it a precious gem. <laughs> I, I had a collaborative experiment with a professor at UC Davis. He had a trial down south in Fresno. And back then, I was a new immigrant to the United States, still going through the immigration process and all that. And he sent me an email. He said, Gurit, can you bomb those trees today? And I said, no, 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 don't, don't write these things on the email. <laughs> so, so, but this is funny how, how we develop this terminology. And this is a really pressurized system. You have the pressurized gas um, inside the container. So you have to be very careful in using it. measures the stem water pressure. Uh, so it basically complements the AT-based scheduling. Now the AT-based scheduling, you know how much water you apply. With the pressure pump, you, you actually know when your trees are getting to a point where you have to start the All these uh, uh, do you have to adjust? So, uh, I mean, uh, all those methods you have to adjust uh, for climate. Am I right? There is not that, for example, in pressure chamber, you in dendrometer. Uh, you should know first when it's, uh, for example, starving or it's thirsty, how it shrinks, and then when you give water, how much it will expand, am I right? So you need to do some uh, pre-calibration to know when it's maximum, when it's minimum. You should do it with, uh, with all of them, uh, with the pressure chamber, when it starts going up. Wait, with the, with the dendrometers and sap flow sensors, yes. So calibration and the companies would actually uh, do the calibration when they install it and they will help you set up. With the pressure chamber, not so much. Um, you only have to know your crop, which is you're using in uh, mature bearing almonds. Um, and you need to know where you are sampling. You have to do, like, pick the leaves from correct position in the canopy. And do that every time uh, when you sample the same trees. And in pressure chamber, really, the calibration is basically not using a lot of different trees every time because that might give you if you are doing regular pressure chamber measurements you just do on the same trees at the same from the same branches around the trunk center of the trunk in the middle canopy similar leaves every time so you will have consistent reading. so that will be the calibration in in case of pressure so this is a small drawing that i made uh, to uh, to teach the concept of pressure chamber. Basically, it's a chamber that you send in uh, the compressed gas into, uh, where you have plugged your leaf. And as your leaf is pressurized, the patio end, which is sticking outside, it actually raises some seat sap outside. So this is basically really a measure of how tightly the water is held within the leaf sap. Okay? The more pressure you need to exert in order to bring that water out, that means the more tightly the water is held inside the plant. That means the lower is um, the stem water potential of that plant. So another thing that you need to know is your how to interpret your readings based on your crop. What does these uh, numbers mean when you measure the pressure chamber readings in bars? Um, what does point minus two bars below zero? So. Uh, the stem water potential is always measured in negative because it's the opposite of pressure, so it is the pull. Uh, so it is always going to be minus in the minus, below zero. So in case of almonds, basically minus eight bars, basically eight bars below zero is low stress. And then coming back to this, that question of mild stress to moderate, I see someone asked me this morning. Uh, this is where they're happy for good shoot growth. Anything higher than that, they will get into issues like diseases or you know, a high, high moisture stress. So low stress is what the almonds are adapted to for general shoot growth. Now when it goes to minus 10 and minus 12, that is mild to moderate stress. So basically that is recommended just before house split. Okay? 
Um, and then moderate, uh, you know, moderate stress basically 10 to minus 10 to minus 14. That's probably uh, the range uh, that the trees in California can withstand. Minus 18 is really high. So that is not desirable. And they change for walnuts and other crops. Another one that's really, um, you know, really very um, popular these days is getting the aerial imagery either through the aircraft or the drones or through the satellite imagery. So they uh, they give you multispectral imaging and DVI, all of that. And uh, they can also interpret data. There are companies that are providing these services. And this is really cool uh, technology and you can manage your orchards really uh, precisely. Okay. Uh, in the research, uh, recent research has developed these correlations of these imagery with ground truthing at the, the, the orchard-based sensors. So we have really good data on that. So we have professional services available. Uh, the next thing that is coming up in um, orchard system is basically big data. Everybody is working on big data and integrating all the sensors. Uh, not just for irrigation technology, but everything, really from nutrient management to to freeze injury, to weather uh, data, all of that, and then correlating it with the yield data. So a few years ago, we had a CDFA funded project where uh, this colleague of mine, uh, he is an engineer, uh, IT guy, so we worked on pistachio to develop a yield predictor of pistachio based on uh, like a artificial intelligence, or you could call machine learning. Uh, so we used, and I, don't know anything about that uh, because I was uh, the physiologist helping him identify the crop stages and the crop factors, and he was the the computer engineer working on the data. Uh, but I know that machine learning is basically the same kind of system that you know, when you go to the internet or the Amazon.com or Google, uh, the internet based on your history or based on your liking, they actually give you the ads, right? If you're a sports fan, they will they will give you the advertisements of sports jerseys and stuff. So uh, that behavior is machine learning. And he applied that behavior, learning from uh, decades of data in pistachios based on all the inputs in the yield. And so we ended up actually developing this yield predictor for pistachios. So everybody is now after uh, integrating big data to, to bring out finer management decision. So we have, I have final five slides to talk about irrigation strategies uh, because recently we have, in recent years, we have been through a couple of drought years. So there, was a, there were a lot of efforts to manage irrigation during a drought period or different irrigation strategies. Uh, I showed you this slide earlier. We talk about different growth stages. Um, stage one is the rapid fruit size development. Stage two is the growth in the size of embryo and endosperm solidification. Uh, and then the, the last stage is the increase in the dry weight of the, the kernel. Okay. During the first, we already discussed that during the first stage of rapid uh, fruit size attainment, if you uh, impose water stress on the crop, uh, you're going to have a reduced nut size. In the second stage, if you have severe deficit in this case, uh, when I talk about mid-May, uh, when the kernel, uh, the, the endosperm is solidly fine, if you have severe water stress, you can get into issues with chitterable nuts. But uh, then there is, um, right after that, the, the, the endosperm solidification, right before house split, there is a window of time in almonds where you can actually reduce water. That's what the California scientists figure. Uh, and the efficient in this period, around, uh, right around the month of June, um, will have minimal effect on yield. If you go later, um, even before harvest, if you don't apply your water back immediately after hull split, all the way to uh, like one week before harvest, so if you keep that period dry, you can get into you know texturing different uh, uh, you know the kernel texture uh, changes, so it can really harm your kernel quality. And then of course deficit in the post harvest period will affect next year's bud growth. Okay. 
Um, stress at any period reduces vegetative growth, because we talked about vegetative growth a lot yesterday and today. Uh, but keep in mind that you know, stress at any period won't suppress your vegetative growth. Uh, there was a research trial done um, to see what happens if you have permanent water shortage the whole season. That might not be the case with most Georgian uh, orchards, because you might have plenty of water, but there may be some scenarios there where you don't have enough water. So they did it in California. This is um, basically the full irrigation, and this percentage of kernel weight, that, that's full irrigation, this is control. And then they compared two irrigation strategies. One, they only have you know 75% or so water available. So they decided to actually apply that available water early on, matching the full ET, uh, but uh, you know, close to mid-May or late May, they cut back their water for the rest of the season. Okay. Uh, so they achieved uh, comparable yields. Then in another scenario, they didn't have even enough water to actually irrigate at full capacity uh, until May. So they had to cut back the water like in mid-March or early April. So they basically started cutting the water right from that, and then they threw out irrigated with less water, whereas in late May, early June, they had, again, severe cutbacks. So then they ended up having significantly less. So it's basically based on the proportion of light water. So, um, so if you stress, uh, if you stress the trees early on, that will affect the entire season and you have a lot of significant effect. Uh, whereas if you can actually apply good amount of water through the early season, uh, you have you will have negative effect for the season. Um, so the bottom line is, in case of almonds, uh, the regulated deficit irrigation, what are the sensitive stages? Leaf out and nut growth, the very sensitive stages. So a uh, big no to any water stress. From mid-June to hull splint, you can cut back on 50% water, that's what the research showed, and still have a uh, minimal effect on yield. At hull splint, again, no. So you, you can't stress too much for a longer period of time. So at hull split, you mean you have to apply water fully. In post-harvest, it depends on when your tree's bud differentiation is complete, and later on in the season, if you are preparing for dormancy, uh, you can maybe cut back the water a little in order to prime your trees for dormancy. Another advantage of uh, irrigation, reduced irrigation during house split or before house split is basically it hastens the house split uh, and makes it uniform. The window of house split gets shorter if you apply a little bit of less water. It reduces the hull rot disease, uh, and they found no significant yield reduction in there. And overall, they found that it's 20, uh, 13 percent water savings. But you must provide water at house bed, sounds good, because those are sensitive stages. <coughs> so, the last slide here, we had a scenario where we had severe drought, water curtailment. And it is just to show that uh, I can. So you had a severe water curtailment in um, this year, and this is a mature orchard, and the yield actually went down. And the following year, the yield again went down and didn't uh, catch up. Uh, and it took two years for the trees, two full years of well irrigated conditions, to come back to the original yield because. Cutting back water one year does not only affect that particular year, because it also has a negative impact on the bud development for the next year. So you are getting hit for two years. So then once you resume the water the next year, and then the following year, then it would like take those two years to come back to the production. So that's what we learned from California. And we can go into the discussion and calculation. Thank you. So do we need to do those calculations again based on your scenarios? I, where is the, okay. So maybe, yeah. 
Yes, so let Not me... Not maybe, actually, yeah. Let me see, you know what? I just realized there are... Because I actually added the slide from the Media Blue website later. Um, after sending you the slides for translation. Let me see here. Because I, I remember I did. Oh, this is uh, this is the slide that I wanted you to show. Have you come across this uh, website? I saw, and maybe you know this location? Uh, so Pardon? Yeah. It's in Kahel. It's Ashish location. Okay. So I found this. Uh, it's a subscription based website. So I got the trial subscription last week. And it gives you precipitation data, wind data, and wind speed. And this is the evapotranspiration in inches. So last week it was like Thursday, Friday for the upcoming week. So. That, that's where I based my calculations on. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking from a different, you know, if I don't have a meteor station, I'm taking from new look clean, I think, in the world by the FL. Yeah. Oh, that's the program. Yeah, I still haven't. I'm still using it. Yeah, uh, I mean, but it's not accurate. I mean, you should, it's approximate. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's uh, so let's just do a scenario. So how would you approach that? The, the same calculation that I we did. So let's see. You have uh, for one of these days you have 0.31. So that is your reference. Oh, oh so okay. Let's make it into millimeters. Okay, so right from this, we can make yeah. it mil mil just write it from the millimeter. So, okay. We have around, uh, this is uh, 8 millimeters, am I right? right? Um, yes, 25.4 uh, times 0 0.31. 7.8. .7. .8. Okay. So you call it 8 for the simplification? Yes, yes. 8 mm, that is your reference uh, for transpiration. Now, your KC, what you're using? Uh, uh, it depends. Uh, I have the uh, minimum, uh, depends the year, I have minimum from 0 0.2 to uh, 0 0.9. Okay, so uh, for June, because we're talking about one of these days last week, so for June we have I'll, 0.9. I would use 0.9, yes, Casey. Okay. Like Casey would be. Yes, let's, let's do 0 0.9. Right, so 0 0.9. So multiply these yeah. two. My ETC would be uh, 8 multiply on 0 0.9, which would be 7.2. Okay. 7.2 mm millimeters, which is 72 tons per hectare. Yeah, so 72 tons per hectare. 0.2 per day. Per day. Yeah. So if I have humans. After I read you know, for three days, this is sorry. This is uh, this is actually these are the slides that you are missing in. Shouldn't tell you only meter the millimeter gram of the quadrant 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 of the so, I developed this formula last week where I still kept the ET in inches per day. Let's just go back to inches per day for a moment. If you plug in your straight number of crop ET in inches per day, which is 0 0.31 multiplied by 0 0.9, it would be 0.28 or something. 0.28. Let's see. So you plug in 
And then I also already figured in the calculations of mm and all of that. So you plug in your tree spacing in meter square. Okay. And then multiply it by the drop EG in inches. Multiply it by 25.38. Okay. Uh, let's say we have uh, six square meter per tree. I mean, six for six times six. Times. Or we have 24. Okay, let's six times. For everybody to be, uh, let's take 24. 24. 24, 24 times. 24 times. 0.28. 24 times. 0.28. 24 times. 0.28. This is the, the EDC. Yeah, 0.28. 0.28. Times 25.38. This is the constant. Okay. That I do. Let's see. So, what is what does this come to? So, uh, should it uh, should it be in square meters? Should I be 24? Or you had it? No, I have. Yeah. Uh, I have did, so this is 170. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is basically your uh, part tree per day. That's 170 um, liters per day per tree. If you want to cross check, so how, how, how many clients do you have? Reception cost to have a clean Let's let's actually calculate back. Let's calculate back and just just to, just to see if this holds good or not. This is um, this is evapotranspiration in acre inches per day, right? Point twenty eight, uh, point twenty eight inches uh, times twenty five point four is basically twenty point three two mm times two point four seven for the hectare, right? 2.47. This is 50 mm, okay? Right? So this is, your requirement uh, is 50 so mm. 0.32 was, uh, no, 0.28 was not inches, day. 25.4 was constant. No, 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 this is, this is, uh, I'm, I'm just getting, this 20, uh, one inch has 25.4 mm. Uh, so I'm converting to mm, right? So tell me how much is 50 mm uh, in terms of um, 50 millimeters of uh, 500 how tons. How many liters? Uh, 200,000. No, no. Almost like millimeter. Only if you And I can I can tell you I can tell you from this. Okay. So let's do this. Point two eight. Time 27154. This is many gallons. 7148 times 7643 times 2.47. This is 18779 gallons per hectare. And times 3.785. This is 71. Thousand liters per hectare. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that about right? Uh, I think yes. it was what, 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 what we wrote down yeah, first time right. in the millimeter too. It was seventy two. Yeah. So basically, yeah, seventy. So let's see, seventy one thousand liters per hectare. That's what we came up with, right? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to see, um, you know, we have. Um, Oh, we have. So then we just divide this number to number of trees. Number of yeah, trees. Yeah. Then, I, that's what we are cross-checking. Okay. So the number of trees were uh, four hundred uh, four hundred and seventeen, right? Yeah. Divided by four hundred and seventeen, one hundred and seventy yeah, liters yeah, yeah. per tree. So with that formula, we came exactly one hundred and seventy. Yeah. But uh, in reality, we don't give the total. In reality, it does reduce the total. So, okay. Okay. So, okay. 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 Okay.
now your actual situation is going to differ based on the numbers you plug. This is basically on this scenario that you have this much evapotranspiration yeah. on a particular day, right? right? So based on your site conditions, based on your evapotranspiration requirements, you will come up with a number. This is just an example on how you can actually calculate. Yeah, we took we took here uh, crop, uh, crop case is 0 0.9. I'm mm -hmm. taking 0 0.25, 0 0.4. I don't. Uh, I'm not taking for one year or two years to create 0 0.5. So yeah. So it's basically, why I give less water yeah. Then. So one year trees. Um, you know, we have a chart that one year old trees. You only now you cut back like 15 percent. Basically, you irrigate at if you have 100 gallons requirement of fully tree, fully mature trees, one year trees you only irrigate 15 gallons because you only have 15% of the can. Second year trees, 20% to 30%, so, so on. So then, I mean, this is basically to walk you through the process. Now, once you know this process, you can plug in anything based on your condition. And also, one more thing. So, uh, you were talking about uh, soil water holding capacity. Yeah. I'm using that one more to determine the uh, um, events in a week, how many events should I have, uh, because I'm not determining how much water should I give. How much water should I give, I determine according to each state. But uh, what should be the uh, interval between the irrigation I determine uh, with the water holding capacity? Yes. Yeah. So for a drip irrigation system, for a drip irrigation system, you start from the other end. You start to to first determine the frequency. If I have a drip irrigation system and I am in July, which is really hot weather, um, so I'm determining that okay, I am irrigating every three days. Okay, so that is what I determine based on prior experience and my calculations of water holding capacity, I know that I have to irrigate every three days. Then I calculate this whole thing based on the three-day requirement. Yes. So that's... If, it, if uh, those three days I have uh, uh, ETC 7.2, that means, and I irrigate it once every three days, that means you should multiply three on uh, 7.2. Right. Basically, you add up for three days, and then don't but forget also, your efficiency factor. Yeah, but also that means that if I irrigate it in every 7.2 uh, this month, every third day, that means I need to, if I'm the owner of the orchard, I need to uh, have uh, bigger pumps, bigger pipes. And so you see that the, those are the things that determine your capability, right? Yeah. So then, you know. So I'm assuming that you have the capability of irrigating that uh, at that level, right? So your system capacity is the first thing that you start with. So if your system capacity is low, that you can only manage small sets, then it's better to manage smaller irrigation zones based on your capacity and then work your way up. Yeah. So maybe do every day. Do every day and then uh, frequency will depend obviously on your system output, that's number one thing. But once you have figured out your system output, then the frequency will depend on your soil type, what holding capacity and the weather. How so, and then, you know, what holding capacity, don't take that on its face value if what holding capacity is one inch per feet, which is uh, 25, um, 25 mm per every feet, right? Yeah, so you are only allowed to utilize, um, you know, half of that. So cut back that to half. So you cannot basically apply what you see on the chart. So you have to further, you have only 50% capacity. Can you go back into water holding capacity? There was a chart which was shown how much. Right. Right. Um, if you do not have good laboratories, how do we determine the water holding capacity? Uh, yeah, I think it's very reliable. Oh no, there there might be some calculations or tools, and resources that you can consult. I I cannot recommend you off the top of my head. Um, well, you need to do mechanical analysis and to know and in, which, in which category of soil soil falls. So if you know it's a plate, then that's 
that's your holding capacity. So there are basically saturation-based uh, extracts that uh, you know soil saturation. And there are simple tools, techniques that the soil scientists use. So you can do rough calculations with this. Okay. Millimeter rules the root is the feet, feet, feet of soil depth. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, with this volume of the water, that more or less is 1,500 cubic meters per hectare in one month in July, more or less. I mean, almost perhaps you can arrive at 2,000 cubic meters per hectare with these soils, uh, supply soils. Is the site implement the nice system? Is the same to implement the, the drainage system? Uh, what system? Drainage. Drainage. Okay. It's my question because the volume of the water is can arrive at 2,000 uh, cubic meters per mm -hmm. month and uh -huh. direct uh -huh. Right. So basically, you have to have good soil drainage. That's what you're asking, right? Yes, but yes, because with uh, soils that you have in, in Cajete, that it's it's. It's clay and a long clay. Right. With these volumes of the water, you need to implement the drainage. Without the drainage system, it's difficult to improve mm -hmm. this volume of the water per hectare. Very, very difficult. So then you cut the water. <laughs> okay. But you need to. So that's uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's a really good point, and that's why it's very important to uh, work on your. And you know, I, I just wanted to mention that in the beginning, that your site. Site-specific conditions will actually determine your irrigation scheduling practice. That is, that's really the case, right? So these are the these are the tools that you can actually use to achieve that. Uh, now, that's another area of discussion whether or not you have proper drainage, and that also um, has uh, you know an impact on your frequency. If you're what you're applying water and it's staying there, not going anywhere for a longer period of time that you might need to reduce your frequency before that water is consumed. But here, we're talking about the tree's water needs. Okay, So if I'm putting that tree in a bucket of water, forget about the soil, and that tree is drinking 20 liters of water every day, and I have a 20 liter bucket, even there is no drainage, that tree is going to end up using that 20 liters of water anyways, right? So we are here calculating the tree's water use and tree's daily needs based on its scan. So the soil factors are really important and the drainage and others, they come into the picture. Um, but still, uh, you can adjust your frequency, longer intervals uh, or smaller intervals based on your soil type. But the tree's water needs, the amount of water that the trees need every day, that is going to be determined by the evaporation and the transpiration primarily. Does it make sense? I mean, you cannot apply too much water at one time in a clay soil. You have to wait for a little bit uh, so you can space out your irrigation. That's for sure. Otherwise, you will create flooding scenarios. Um, but uh, but you have to meet your trees' water needs. So you cannot even apply less water than your trees will need to drink. So that is it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a square foot or, or cubic foot or... That is the... Cubic, yeah. I mean. So we basically measure basically on, on the depth uh, because that's really not not in the cubic foot, not not in the volume, it's basically the depth. Okay. No. Yeah. Only the, only the depth. Only the depth. Yeah. Foot is 30 centimeters, yes? So basically, considering that in the call. Okay. Okay. Now, so yeah, these are. 
Now these were the slides that I added later. So this is what we want to do. So, see, um, okay, maybe anybody else wants to do. Yeah, if you want to. Are, are we are we on the same page regarding those calculations and uh, the basic fundamental yeah. of it? Kind of, and I have one question about the humidity or the air humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, different plants have different uh, demand, different ideal air humidity. Sometimes in Georgia we have as low humidity as uh, like 15 uh, relative humidity. I mean. mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, stress for an almond tree or uh, it's okay for an almond tree? Humidity um, in California these days, uh, we are in the teens, like 18% relative humidity, 16%. So it's okay. So, you know, and that's, that's going to have a big impact on the evapotranspiration. So, very low relative humidity means the trees are going to lose um, more water quickly uh, because uh, the vapor pressure deficit will be more. So the VPD basically, uh, the, the RH will dictate the VPD and the VPD will dictate the PT. So your trees are basically losing more water. So very dry conditions, along with windy conditions, I had it in one slide, it creates uh, you know, a lot of stress on the plant in terms of very good, you know, eating. So this is basically loss of water. So you have to keep up with that. Uh, and if we uh, want to uh, compare, like how many active uh, day temperatures or how many joules per year uh, do almonds need to get a good production? Uh, do you know the kind of number or uh, there's a kind of, some kind of number of that? So how many uh, joules per year or how many active day joules or uh, what is the power activity for per year that is recommended for almonds? Oh, the power in terms of light? Yes, in terms of light. I have not... Or temperature. I have not worked out uh, that it's, figure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but uh, we can, you know, we can explore that. Okay. The question is, uh, if the, if you are giving so much water, and, uh, okay, for, let's say, uh, 80 uh, tons per day per hectare, and the water EC is high, that means that we are bringing a lot of salts to the soil. And then we need some time to drench these salts, so to wash down the salts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if, it, if you have salty water, then it will make it very difficult to grow almonds, yes? Yeah. yeah. So bringing salinity into this picture totally changes the scenario, yeah. right? And salinity in irrigation water creates the double, uh, you know, complication because now your water is there, but the trees cannot take that water because of high salinity, because of osmotic, uh, osmotic adjustments or osmotic uh, pressure, uh, and we call it a physiological drought. Yeah. Water is present, but the trees cannot get it. Now you have to actually apply more water in order for the trees to survive, but then more water brings more salts, and to wash those salts down, you apply more water and bring more, more salts. So let's call to rain. Call to rain. <laughs> yeah. So, so we need rain. that's what that's what uh, you know we recommend in you know during the rainy season. Uh, we if you have a high irrigation water EC scenario or even high EC, and we are expecting rain in for example first week of November. So in California we recommend to the people if you have high salinity and you want to wash it down, you don't just rely on the rain. Before the rain, you fill the soil profile already uh -huh. because when it rains, there is already water present in that gets pushed down. Oh. Best thing is fine. And um, the, one, one more question I had. Oh, my throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, so many, so many different aspects. Let's ask for something. And when you have salty rain, in this case, 
Now we don't have salt here. <laughs> do we do we yeah, do we have salt here in here? I don't know. Yeah. You will get probably salty pistachio, so salty almonds. It will more taste. <laughs> I don't know. I mean look at California. We grow uh, we grow pistachios on the most marginal land. That have like high EC, really high. The question that I uh, now that I remember it, so if you don't irrigate almonds in California, mm -hmm. uh, so if, if it is grown tree and you your irrigation is broken or yeah you don't care about irrigation, you don't irrigate for whole year. What happens then? Tree will die or it will not give the production. So if you just stop irrigation altogether? <laughs> yeah. The trees are not going to die all of a sudden in the, in the middle of the season, okay? So depending on like how big vigorous the trees are, uh, you will probably get uh, the trees standing. So why? Because there is still stored moisture in the soil, um, and the trees will manage to get through the season, uh, but they will be severely damaged. Uh, you can't expect any crop, and you cannot expect any crop the next year. Uh, and it will take, uh, you know, even more than two years because you did not uh, apply a single drop of water. So it will be really hard to bring those trees back because they will, they might have some severe dieback cases. But theoretically, almond trees would survive. And if you want to see that your tree has live tissue at the end of the year, they will be okay. They will be having live tissue. But if you're talking about a uh, really productive orchard, then forget about that thing okay. for a couple of minutes. What about pistachios? Pistachios will be kind pistachios of... Pistachios are a little more uh, drought tolerant. There are a couple of reasons. First, one, they are adapted to more arid climates. And pistachios' water requirements are lesser in terms of inches, about 3 feet, 36 inches, as opposed to 52 inches in the case of almonds. And also, the pistachios are what we call phreatophytes. Phreatophytes are the trees who actually grow their roots down deeper into the ground in search of water. So pistachios can really, really fish for deeper water if, if they don't get it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can pistachio trees reach for groundwater? The, the groundwater, like deeper groundwater? Uh, no, uh, I mean, I, I've seen pistachio roots growing like 9 feet, 10 feet, 11 feet. So, but not, you know, almond, they stay in 4 to 5 feet, but pistachio roots are deeper. But we can't expect it like, like deeper, deeper. And talking about EC and pistachios, uh, we have a elaborate experiment uh, going on in California on salinity and pistachios that I'm a part of. And we have seen that the pistachio trees are really resilient um, up to uh, an EC of eight decimals. They can really tolerate it well. So if the EC goes beyond eight, then the trees yield start declining. We have a scenario where the, that company is applying a high salt water because it's drainage water. You know. The district, uh, you know, the soil is full of, loaded with salt, and all the orchards in that area, they apply water even from the, from the canal. But when that water goes down below in the drainage system, it is loaded with salts. So the irrigation district collects that water, and they had this huge amounts of water they, they wanted to use. So they decided to plant pistachios and use that water. And uh, we are working in that orchard that was planted in 2002. And the uh, EC of that water that they are applying is 18. Wow. Just as a reference, the electrical conductivity of seawater, ocean water, is 40 decimals. So the EC of that water is 18. With a little bit of management and then rains and then getting you know, uh, getting canal water here and there. Uh, those trees are producing. So those trees are producing. I mean, not a, like a record crop, but they're still managing to produce.
but almost as this. So pistachios uh, looks like a little bit um, hollow feeds. Yeah. yeah, they are hollow feeds. Yeah. After five or six, you know, it's a little bit hollow feeds. Pistachios. Uh, yes, but, but um, you know, in, in, yeah, relatively they are more soft. And we have, a, you know, we can go into that discussion on how pistachios compartmentalize sodium and chloride into the vacuoles at cellular levels, and the rootstock is really an important part of that discussion. I think we are going to have the same kind of trial in Georgia with almost because now we have farm plantation where um, the EC is 4.8. And they are gonna irrigate with that water because they don't have any other solution. So I know what happens with those almonds. Yeah, the almonds, yeah, the almonds. Yeah, four point eight, and I think it's gonna be really struggling. Yeah, the water management will be the key. I do is the marketing part. Oh yes, um, I. Is that in English or? I wish can you repeat the question? Like uh, the soil was put on the. If the grafted onion is buried, grafting point is know. covered with soil. Okay. So it's not visible. So the we, basically, we will die or not. The basically, <laughs> basically the 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 point where you are grafting the bud. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Budding is really an interesting, and we did not go into the details of uh, propagation and budding, um, but there are a lot of factors that can actually impact budding, and one of them would be the soil would bring a lot of things like moisture and then you know disease and all that uh, in, infection and infestation. So it can really harm uh, the bud survival. So uh, it it will you know likely it's likely to to kill that but you know it's already a tree it's it is already a tree but it's tree oh but a tree yeah it's already a tree but oh, then you're talking about the crotch oh, oh oh okay now i okay 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 let me okay so now i got your point <laughs> but the point is under the soil Right, 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 right. But now I got, got your point because that's the common problem in California. You're talking about the soil touching the graft union, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so this is the graft union, where's the root stock, and then you have the roots. So this is the soil line, right? So we recommend that your, your root zone should be buried in, under the soil, right? But your graft union should be a few inches above the soil line. Because when your soil comes up and touches, you know, sometimes you make berms and your graft union is buried. Now, what's happening? You selected the rootstock for the best performance against soil borne pathogens because your rootstock is very good at fighting Phytophthora and other pathogens, right? But now, uh, your soil is touching the top part, the scion, which is not effective in fighting those infections. So that is the reason that the tree will actually get infection, because now you lost the advantage that you were gaining by using that common rootstock, right? So that is a big no-no. We, we tell the growers, if we walk the field and see the, 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 the burns, touching the, the graft union point, we tell them to take the soil off.
So the soil should not touch the portion above because then you lose the advantage that otherwise. Because roots will grow. <coughs> Uh, so the uh, reason is that we uh, roots will start grow from the zion. From the where I start grow from the zion. Yeah, the, 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 the roots are not going to grow, but but basically the soil contains some soil or pathogen. Uh, like pythium, like phytophthora, and other soil-borne pathogen complex, the fungi. So there are a lot of fungi in the, and now you are irrigating that soil also. also. So you are creating a situation where you already have the fungus present in the soil. You are applying that water, you are wetting that area. So it creates a perfect scenario for fungus. All right. What is the 351? So we we were talking about now we have uh, one more topic uh, to discuss the nitrogen um, and fertilizer management. Then uh, a lot of topics that I also brought, including the pest and disease management then round the year activities that we do in California all the way from dormant season through bloom through pre-harvest, post-harvest. So I have uh, about 70 slides in that presentation. And then I have a uh, small presentation on new tree establishment right from, you know, starting the soil preparation and all of that. So what I was thinking is it is best to discuss those topics in the review lectures that we are meeting on the 7th, right? After my visits to the orchards, and I will have a lot of feedback on the situation of the orchard system. So uh, we will get an overview discussion on the canker diseases, the fungal diseases, the pests, and round the year monitoring and management on the July 7th. So today, for the remaining time, we can actually discuss the, uh, the, the fertilizer management, the, the nitrogen management, in the same way as we discuss the water management, as we do in California. And then if we have some time, uh, I still have the varieties and root stocks presentation. That I okay. uh, we are midway through. Um, do you want to take a break or? Coffee break. 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 Coffee